welcome to Whiskey and Wolf. My name is Shannon and I'm coming to you from northern New Jersey where I live and craft. Um, it is actually a slightly cooler day than what we've been having. We've been having 90 degree sweaty humid days the last um, few weeks and today it's overcast, but I'm getting nice light coming in over here. Um, and it's cooler. It's a little cooler. So it actually felt kind of great when I went outside earlier today. Uh, it is July 31st. I cannot believe July is over and tomorrow is August. So I'm a little late with this episode because I recorded an entire episode last Friday and Yeah, it was, it was painful, I should say, to lose an entire episode. And by the time I realized it was gone, it was already Sunday afternoon. And there was just no time and I didn't have any energy to re-record. So I'm going to do my best to recreate what would have been an episode from last week. Or maybe whatever. This is what it is, right? Whatever happens, happens. It's all going to be... Um, fairly new and fresh. If you didn't watch my vlogs, it will definitely be new and fresh. If you watched my vlogs, this will be a, a continuation because um, a whole week has passed now since I first recorded. The saddest part was losing the whiskey chat. So I lost that chat and that tasting. I didn't, I, it was one of my little sample bottles and I don't have another one of that so I will not be able to recreate that whiskey chat so and it was it was a Campbelltown whiskey it was Glen Scotia um, there are three distilleries in Campbelltown it has a very interesting history and it inspired me after I had studied the Glen Scotia processes and history I was I was inspired to try another Campbelltown distilleries whiskey and I was though I was a little bummed that I didn't get the exact bottle I wanted I wanted so I, I what you're going to see next is Springbank tenure I did not want to test the tenure necessarily I really wanted the uh, 15 or 18 year but my local place didn't have it so I got what I got <laughs> anyway I'm gonna send you on over to the whiskey chat right now and I will see you soon I'll tell you where to skip to if you do not want to watch it hi welcome to the whiskey chat I'm gonna talk to you today about a Campbelltown whiskey which I don't think I have done any Campbelltown whiskeys I think there's only three distilleries there right now but today I'm going to talk to you about Spring Bank. Um, I want really didn't I wanted um, not the ten year, but I wanted the fifteen or eighteen year. But this was all my local um, liquor store had the one that I happened to go to. It's really affordable. It's a very affordable bottle. I want I don't remember the exact price. I'm going to correct myself on screen if I'm wrong. But I want to say it was about $45, $48, less than $50. So it was a really good value. And the super cool thing about Spring Bank is that they're one of these distilleries that have been in existence both illegally and legally since the 1590s <laughs> and they've been in the same family so that's very very cool um, it is the Mitchell family so wait let me bop over to the website that has the history they have a very very long history in Campbelltown oh first let me show you where Campbelltown is in case you're not sure so I lost some footage of a whiskey chat from the distillery Glen Scotia so Glen Scotia is also in Campbelltown the third distillery in, in Campbelltown is Glen Gyle G I'm gonna talk to you about them later G Y L E um, and they anyway the um, Springbank and Glen Gyle are the same family so that's cool too I love that um, okay so let me go to the history. Um, 
officially, <laughs> Springbank was established by Archibald Mitchell in 1828. That was when it was legal. Before that, though, wind the clock back to 1591, that is the first reference about Campbelltown whiskey recording in writing. Um, and then in 1601, Campbelltown became a whiskey smuggling center, and it was known for the illegal production of whiskey, also known as Aquavite, Water of Life, um, for UK folks, I guess. Um, in the 1660s, the Mitchell family came to Campbelltown as settlers. They came from the lowlands, but some of the family members were already maltsters, so they had already had some experience in making whiskey. And then in 1814, there were 22 legal distilleries in operation in Campbelltown. Um, so I, I thought it was 1822 that um, that the law passed that distilling, distilling whiskey could be a legal activity. I thought it was 1822, but maybe it was a little earlier. So this is saying 1814. I'm reading off of their website just for reference because um, they have a very long history. Not all the websites of these distilleries share their history. This is like a really comprehensive one. Um, so anyway... Archibald Mitchell and his brother, Hugh Mitchell, worked for a competitor, a future, or, um, yeah, future competitor at first. So they worked for Rye Clacon. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. I'm putting it on screen so you can see it and my UK folks can correct me. Distillery. They're no longer in operation. I think they, I'll, I'll get to when they ceased. It was somewhere in the 1980s, I want to say. Um, that distillery. Springbank continued. So, um... Archibald Mitchell established Springbank and became the 14th licensed distillery in Campbelltown. The reason that Campbelltown was such a um, high producing area was because it had all of the things that you needed for to make whiskey. It had the 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 barley or the the cereal grains. It had water, and it had uh, a source of fuel and most importantly, um, when steam navigation came into effect, like steam trains and steam boats came into to, um, existence, they were able to transport the whiskey very quickly to big city regions like Glasgow. Okay. In 1834, um, Archibald's sister, Mary Mitchell, builds, builds Drewmore Distillery. Um, and then in 1837, Archibald's sons took ownership of Springbank, John and William. And in 1838, a year later, John Walker, yes, that Johnny Walker, <laughs> recognized the profile of Springbank and purchased 118 gallons. Um, probably his first foray into whiskeys. Um, in 1872, the demand for Campbelltown malts seemed to be insatiable. So that was when John's brother William decided to open Glen Guile Distillery, which is still in operation today. There, It had a, what do they call it? It went silent. That's what they call it. It went silent for a little while, but it's back and operating today. Um, in 1891, Campbelltown had a population of just under 2,000, but it was reputed to be the richest town in Great Britain per capita. Pretty exciting times for them. That was around the steamboat times, I believe. Steam navigation. Um, in the 1900s, the turn of the century brought a change of whiskey preferences, and Springbank altered their production to make a lighter whiskey that was not heavily peated, so they switched to using coal rather than peat to dry malt. I think they're back to using peat. Pretty sure I saw that. Um, in the 1920s, Campbelltown distilleries started to cut corners to meet the demands for whiskey, and blenders who were buying, who'd buy up like the excess of the single malts and stuff, started to look elsewhere besides Campbelltown for their blending uh, whiskeys. And then in the 20th century, um, through in the later 1920s, um, 
Glenn Guile was sold by William Mitchell to another company and it and it had and then later it ceased trading so it went silent and then in 1934 in the the depression era hit and uh, there was it was tough times Rycliffe closed its doors and it left only Springbank and Glen Scotia operating Campbelltown and there was like this long sort of simmer that just went on with those two um, distilleries. Then there wasn't much going on in the region until the 1980s. Um, there were, I mean, Springbank continued to do a couple things. They introduced a 50 year whiskey that had been distilled in 1919. They introduced it in 1970. And then, um, they also started, they went back to doing peated um, whiskeys. So they did long, this one called that they called long row, which you can still get today. Um, they wanted to compete with the Elay style malts, um, because those are very peated and, um, yeah, through the eighties, there was a general downturn of whiskey. Like whiskey wasn't as important for folks. People weren't really drinking it all that much. Um, but then, the late 80s, early 90s, production starts to take off again. Um, and there was, you know, this demand for more that just has climbed and climbed and climbed. Um, in 1997, Springbank in introduced a new whiskey that was triple distilled called Hazelburn, um, which is very interesting. And in 2000, Headley Wright, who is the current chairman of Springbank and the great-great-grandson of Archibald Mitchell, bought back Glengyle Distillery. So now Glengyle is part of the Springbank family again, that Mitchell, um, original Mitchell family. Um, they rebuilt it, and uh, it became, in, in 2004, it became, Glengyle became the first distillery in Campbelltown in over 100 years, and the first distillery built in Scotland in the 21st century. So that's super cool. Um, and then Campbelltown was once again recognized as a distinct whiskey region. I think because there's something about three, like that has to have three distilleries in the region to be considered a whiskey, you know, a whiskey, like to make the map of whiskey regions. Um, and, oh, their process, they have a lot about their process too. And they talk a lot about the malting. So malting is when you, when, um, when you see these, I'm going to put a picture on screen of um, the grain being stacked like six to ten inches on a floor, and then it's so it's laid out to to dry, um, and then they kiln it, so they cook it essentially, and then after that they mill it, and then they mash it. So mashing it is putting it in this mixture of water to um, extract all the sugars and all of that. Um, yeah, and then last is fermentation and distillation. And then finally it goes into a cask. So they tend to do the same um, cask combos that many of the other distilleries do. So a bourbon, uh, American bourbon cask, followed by a sherry cask for like a double cask um, maturation process. I'm just going to find, uh, tell you a little bit about their three brands. So they have Springbank, uh, Long Row, and Hazelburn. So Springbank is their traditional one that they've been distilling since 1828, officially. Um, and it has the, it's lightly peated, they call it lightly peated, and a unique two and a half times dis distillation process um, and they have a 10-year, a 12-year, a 15-year, 18-year, and 21-year. Long Row was first distilled in 1973, and it is um, the result of an experimentation that was who's, of, a, of their chairman who was setting out to prove that an Elay-style single malt could be produced on the mainland. Um, and that's their heavily peated smoky whiskey. So if you're if you're into those heavy peat smoky flavors like what you can find on Ely, you might like that. They have a peated, a red, and an 18-year. And then last, Hazelburn, which is our most recent. Um, 
That uses malt that's only air dried, so not kiln dried. And they distill the whiskey three times through their copper stills. So it ends up being a light, fruity, and subtle um, whiskey. And they have a 10 and 12 year of that. So I'm drinking this Springbank. Springbank is supposed to be very, very drinkable. All right, so let's look at the 10 year. All right, so here it is. Let's see. It's a pretty light gold color. It, um, I think you can probably see it best there. You can see it's pretty light. I've put my sprinkle of water in. Okay, it has like a real red fruit, like I would say plum, like a very sort of plummy flavor, uh, smell. Yeah, that's like front and center. It reminds me of, of taking a whiff of a, of a plum pie that has a slightly smoky um, scent to it. Oh, wow. Not at all what I expected on the tongue. What was that flavor? It's not plum at all. So you smell the plum and a little bit of smoke, but you don't get that in the taste. You get more of a, I would say pear or peach taste, like a burst of it right up front. And then it's followed by like pie crust. And then you get spice, like pepper. <laughs> Am I describing it in a way that makes you really want to try it? <laughs> All right, let's see what they say. Um, I So Flavio, who I love, they don't have a profile of this. I looked for one. Okay. Oh, they say on the nose you should be smelling pear with a hint of peat and vanilla. I don't really smell that. It It's almost like there's a little bit of a cinnamony smell. And then on the palate, they're saying oak, spice, cinnamon, vanilla. Maybe. Hmm. Okay, and then lingering salty tingle. Yeah. For sure. I did find another site that had um, a breakdown. And uh, Flavia did do the um, flavor spiral that they usually do. It just doesn't look right, though. Yeah. Um, hey, let's use this one. Okay. This says on the nose, guava, guava, honey, and soft smoke. Okay. That's what I was tasting. And then on the palate, marzipan <laughs> and cigar <laughs> box, cigar box. <laughs> Finish smoky, trailing off into cider. Hmm. Oh, cool. Yeah, I could see that. But also that salty. There's definitely the sort of a sweet, salty finish. Like, you get this like sort of salty, smoky taste at the end. It's really good. Um, the uh, critics that I'm on um, malt, masterofmalt.com because flavier.com didn't have Springbank tenure. They had the other Springbanks, but not the tenure. I don't know why. Uh, oh, here, some, some of the critics are saying fresh cut apples, earth, and smoke um, as the flavor. They're also saying it's very drinkable. Uh, similar in style to Ardbeg. Uh, what else? Good quality, good, good value. Um, yeah, the real, the real deal. All right. 
I hope you enjoyed this whiskey chat. Um, I hope sometime to actually really want to try Glen Giles whiskeys now, now that I know it's the same family and, you know, same operation, to just see what's different about that, about how they do those. Also, their Long Row and um, the Hazel Burn also sound very interesting and probably worth a try if I see them. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this whiskey chat and you get a chance to try a dram or something else of your choice. I will see you next time. Bye. Okay, you're back. I hope you enjoyed that. It was uh, really interesting, very surprising um, distillery. I did not expect to find a distillery that had been in the family, in the same family for so many hundreds of years. So that was really cool. Anyway, let's get into the wool. First, oh, actually, let me just start with my, what I'm wearing, which is not wool, but it's wool related. This is a Hohe & Co. t-shirt. Um, it's from her first round of tees. She's made another one since I have not seen this one in her shop. Um, for a while, but that doesn't mean she won't ever have it again. Um, but yeah, I, I, I bought it a while ago. One of her, it, when she first launched the t-shirt. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm wearing. Martha here is wearing my Rye Laring tee. I'm gonna just tilt the camera up a little bit so you could see it better. That's probably a little too much. There we go. And over. There. Now you can see Martha quite well. Look at this cool pooling I got. I love that. Um, yeah, so this is the Rye Laring Tea. I finished it. I finished it uh, about 10 days ago. I just recently posted it on Instagram if you follow me there. Um, but I have actually had it done for a while. I just for uh, several, oh, over a week, maybe two. Um, and I didn't wear it today because I didn't plan on recording today and I was already dressed and I, um, yeah. So this is the Rye Laring Tea. It's a pattern of my own design. It is a choose your own adventure in terms of stitch. It's written, the pattern is written for some sort of rib stitch. Um, and you, though you can do stockinette, one of my testers did stockinette and it worked out just fine. Uh, it, the t-shirt is a written as a long sleeve t-shirt, but you could do any length you want. For this version, I chose to do sleeveless because uh, it's summertime and I wanted something nice to wear for work in the summer. And even though I am working from home, working remotely, I... Um, Try not to make any noise over here. I, because I need to show you the yarn. I, <laughs> I still need to dress from the shoulders up, from like here up. So this is a really nice neckline for Zoom calls. You don't want to wear anything B and plunging, I don't think. Not for the kind of work I do anyway. Um, so nothing revealing is, uh, I just wouldn't feel comfortable. So yeah, this is really great for that, and I love it. The story of the yarn is it is um, Sweet Sparrow Yarn Company. Uh, the pattern is written for sport weight, so this is a sport weight. It's from her mystery batches. What she does is uh, she has a small, she does small groupings of one-off colorways. She sells in uh, at deep discounts in two skein or three skein or four skein bags. This was a two skein bag. This took me exactly two skeins. This is all I have left. Um, and this is the size three, I think. I think size three, I think. The pattern is written from like a 36 inch or 35 inch all the way up to a um, 64 inch, I wanna say. I should know, right? It's my own pattern. <laughs> Uh, I just don't remember. I know it's very, uh, it's, yeah, it's written for nine sizes. Uh, 32, actually. It goes from size 32 to 64. 
At least that was the draft. I, I'm, I'm looking at a draft. <laughs> but I think that's accurate. That sounds about right. Um, and yeah, what else can I tell you? I had hoped that I could get enough for a little sleeve, but I didn't have enough yarn to do a little sleeve, but whatever, it's fine. I like it. It looks nice. It looks great with jeans and it looks great with like my jean shorts and it looks good with skirts. I have a picture of myself wearing it, which I will pop on here and then I'm going to move on. I think I've told you everything that you need to know. Um, the rib stitch I used here was a, it's a three by one, right? Yes, three by one, three by one. I found that my size works best if the stitch is divisible by increments of two or four. So I did three by four. I did another one, a long sleeve version, which you can see in my project page on Ravelry or I'll, um, if, you, if Ravelry is not friendly for you, if it's inaccessible for you, please just let me know if you want any other information. I don't mind. Um, direct messaging at all. So you can go ahead and just direct message me through Instagram if that works for you or just put a comment on YouTube and I will try to figure out how to reach out to you um, with other information. Some of the, if it's just a quick question, I can answer it in the comments. But yeah, I do want to be, I am aware that Ravelry is problematic for lots of folks and just want to uh, put it out there that I am willing to work with you if that's, if you are one of them. One, one of those people who are who is having trouble. Anyway, that is the back. It's a nice, a really nice fitting garment and I'm pretty pleased with it. Yeah, so pleased I made another one. <laughs> I cast on another one. I do have, before I show you that though, I do have a couple other finished objects that are not here. So I have made, I have this that is here, this little baby hat. Um, I have a granddaughter on the way in October and uh, I have been making baby things. So if you have babies in your life and like to knit for them, um, you're going to like my episodes the next for the rest of the year and probably into the next couple as well because I'll be making um, things for babies and toddlers over the next little while. It, that's not all you'll see though. Those are just some of my knits. So anyway, they're just they happen to be a lot of my FOs because they work. They're so fast. So this is a little just I I winged it um, knit hat pattern. I uh, just cast on. It seemed to be like a DK weight. This is a the yarn is a hand spun from a friend that uh, a swap actually that I did with a woman who I believe she's in Chicago area and she she has a friend who has a sheep farm. So some of her um, the hand spun that she gave me, like I think this was one, was from wool from her friend's farm. Because it seemed very lanily. Like I've washed it now and it's it feels more like um, regular wool. has a really nice soft feel to it, this wool. Um, but yeah, so I made this hat. This is like I would say a more like a six nine maybe even 12 month size it's definitely not newborn i made another one a blue one from her yarn as well that i will put a picture on screen here because i've already given it to the parents to my son and daughter-in-law and from my last full episode <laughs> I, if you remember i was working on the elizabeth zimmerman sweater um, baby sweater. I finished that for them as well and that is also with them so I don't have it. I did, I think last time I had figured out, that, yes, in my last episode I talked about that I had run out of yarn for the sleeves. Like I, it turned out I need about 250 yards of DK weight to make the pattern as written. Um, yeah, so I had run out and I ended up subbing in some DK uh, spin cycle yarn that I had so it ended up having like kind of a, a light pink sleeve and then a dark pink sleeve with this pastel rainbow yarn that I had used up. And uh, I don't know, it, it's, I thought it came out cute and the parents seemed delighted. So that was all that matters. I think that what I figured out there was that that sweater was a size... Um, probably 12, even 18 month size. Like the, the cool thing about that pattern, the Elizabeth Zimmerman pattern, is that you 
um, the baby, the way it's knit, the sleeves don't have any decreases. Like it's meant to kind of be a an unfitted sleeve. So when when um, the baby first wears it, it, maybe the parents are rolling the sleeve a little bit to make it so that it's not, you know, covering. Which you don't want a baby's sweater to really cover their hands at all because they're just gonna end. It's just gonna end up in their mouths. So the mo the parents may be rolling the sleeves at first, but then the baby can keep growing and the sleeve can keep going up the arm. And it's very roomy in the body too, so it ha it these the sweater pattern lasts for a really long time in terms of or the sweater that you knit will last for a long time. This baby's growth out of things so quickly can be very disappointing to knit something by hand, put all that time into something, and then have the baby outgrow it so fast. And or even even for the parents, like to have this beautiful handmade object that they can only put on their their child for. A month you know before they aren't able to wear it anymore so um, that that's one of the reasons why I really like that pattern it's a pattern that uh, seems to grow with the babies because of the its structure with that rounded yoke that it has because nevertheless because that sweater came out to be like at least a year old size I wanted to knit a smaller version that I thought that the baby could wear earlier. So I, oh, this is gonna get into some new stash. So this is some new stash. I uh, had some more sport weight um, that I purchased. This is Lobby and Amay. Um, the colorway is We Rainbow. There you go. It's a beautiful turquoise, Blue, not quite robin's egg blue, it's a little deeper, with rainbow speckles. So it's called Wee Rainbow on a Vespa. Uh, again, sport weight. And I have um, almost completed, this is going to roll away, so let me just put it over here. I've almost completed a second version of the Elizabeth Zimmerman sweater. And it is much smaller. So I did a couple things, a couple modifications to the pattern. So I just have to finish a few more repeats of lace on this sleeve. Then it gets blocked and the button sewn on and it's all done. Um, I would say this is more like a three month old size. Uh, maybe, yeah. So you see what I mean about the sleeves not having any decrease? So um, the baby, if she stays or if this fits, as long as this fits her torf, so she can continue to wear the sweater even if the sleeves start getting, you know, creeping up her arms, so to speak. Um, so yeah, that's that's one of the reasons why I like it. I love the, I love the pattern too. It's so pretty. Yeah, and this like garter yoke is very stretchy and um, size friendly, size inclusive friendly. So anyway, back to what I was saying about the mods. So what I did to get from a size, uh, a one-year-old size, I would say to about a three to six month size, I went down yarn size. So I went from DK to a um, sport weight. And then I went down one needle size. So I had used a size five needle in the DK. I went down to size four. And I also did less length, let me just hold it this way. I didn't knit as long to where you separate from the sleeves, for the sleeves, and I also knit this length a little shorter, and of course the sleeves a little shorter. So that's, oh, and one less lace repeat under the arm. Um, so the other one had two, the pattern calls for two lace repeats, I just did one. Um, when I was looking at the, first one that first version that I made for this baby because <laughs> I've made like 20 of these like 20 years ago um, when I was looking at the first one I was realizing that I, pro I probably could have taken out a lace repeat under the arm on that version on that size as well because it seemed like it was pretty wide uh, there was a lot of extra width and stuff um, so yeah, that is, those are the changes that I made. Um, I also, the pattern is written, if you get it from the same book that I got it from, 
the pattern is written top down but she has you stop and knit the sleeves like when you get to the sleeves instead of splitting for them you actually do those sleeves right then and you do them back and forth I decided to put those stitches on hold and continue knitting the body just like we always like we normally do on a top-down sweater um, and I um, came back with uh, DPNs to do the sleeve so that's that's where I'm at um, the one thing to remember with the lace pattern is that uh, when you are knitting back and forth on the wrong side row, you're purl, you're yes, you're purling, you're just purling everything. The right side row is the row where you're doing the yarn overs and the knits together's and stuff. Um, so when you're knitting the round, you do the yarn overs and knits together's, and then you do a knit round instead. So it's just it's important to remember. I did actually not do that one time. <laughs> the first when I started this sleeve I was fine on the other um, version but on this sleeve I did that one time and realized right away that that was a mistake and that I needed to knit I just I just didn't remember so yeah this little darling is almost done and I already have my next baby sweater planned I'll talk to you about that in a little bit because I'm going to show you the yarn that I bought for uh, for that. Uh, let me let me do a kind of kind of mm, not very exciting. I guess maybe it'll be exciting if you haven't seen my <laughs> my last episodes, uh, my last couple episodes. It'll this will be exciting. Um, <laughs> so I made a little progress on my pink velvet. Not tremendous, but a little bit. I'm not, I haven't really been working that diligently on this pattern because it's too hot to wear it. So I've been more interested in baby knits for sure and uh, doing the, doing, finishing this and, you know, other spinning projects and stuff. Plus, if you've been watching my episodes, you know I've been obsessed about another sweater, my next whip, which I will show you. Let me just tell you quickly what this is in case you're interested. Also, remember this right here because I'm going to show you a spinning project that this is a reference point for. Um, so this is Melted Baby Surrey uh, Ching Fiber. Oh, I forgot to tell you the pattern. The pattern is Pink Velvet by Andrea Mowry. Um, and I was inspired by Caroline of Knitting Vicariously of that channel and she talked about the pattern and how much she loved it and I as I was sitting there listening to her, I thought to myself, I think I have yarn to make this sweater. And I stopped, actually paused, put her on pause, and went over to my stash to see if I did, in fact, and I did. So, oh, oh my goodness, my nose is so itchy. Um, so yeah, this is yarn that is from my stash. This uh, Melted Baby Surrey from Ching Fiber is... Um, the colorway Aurora, and it is leftover yarn from a pattern that I knit in January called the Saucy Surrey Bomber Jacket. Um, and yes, yeah, so it was leftover. I had bought six skeins for that project, and I only needed four. But it, that's another pattern of my own design, and I wasn't sure how much yarn I was going to use at all. I just had no idea, so I went and bought extra. Uh, the green, this gorgeous green with white fuzz on it is from great the gray sheep company and it is the colorway squid ink pasta in the stein wool fine wool which is i didn't realize i thought it was fingering but it's classified as a sport weight i have a lot of sport weight <laughs> um yeah so this is coming along it's something that I take out and knit on every uh, now and then. Um, it's really nice. You don't have to think about what you're doing. I'm in the part where I'm just doing the knitting in the round to finish the body. Um, the pink velvet pattern is a crop sweater, so I won't be making this that cropped because I have a lot of boobage to cover. <laughs> and... <laughs> Also, I don't really think cropped. So if you see, like, Martha fits, Martha is me, verse basically in mannequin form. So my waist is at the same point where hers is. There's not a lot of inches between the end of the 
breast and the waist, it's really about two and a half, I'd say maybe three. Um, true on myself as well. So she has you ended at the waist. It's a little too short for me. It just doesn't look proportionately right when you're this size. So um, I'm going to go a little longer. It'll probably be pretty close to what this sweater is right here uh, in terms of its length. I have plenty of yarn, so I'll be able to do that length without any trouble. Um, yes, I think I should be, I should maybe knit a few more inches and then go ahead and switch to the ribbing, which isn't going to happen. So yeah, I'm just kind of lollygagging on this one, just moving along at my own pace, make knitting some rows here and there when I need something. If I'm watching like a foreign language film or if I'm in a meeting and I, and I just want to have my hands doing something, but it's something that I don't really want to have to pay attention to. It's really awesome for that. Very awesome for that. Okay. One more. <laughs> this is another new cast on since the last time I did a full episode. Um, this is a, another Rye Laring tee in um, a sport weight. This is a mostly stockinette version. I have done a little bit of a rib paneling, a two by two rib paneling down the front. Um, and this is destined again to be either short sleeve or sleeveless depending on my yarn yield. I have exactly the same amount of yarn for this one that I did for this one. And the only thing that'll make a difference is if rib, I'm not sure, I just don't know this off the top of my head, if rib uses more yarn than stockinette stitch. I think it does use a little bit more, but I'm not sure how much. Um, I'm not sure what the percentage is. So I may have enough extra to do maybe a little sleeve. We'll see. Okay, the yarn is um, Stranded Dye Works. Wash your hands. It's really beautiful. It's totally my colors. It is purple, green, pink, and uh, navy, which is so pretty. I have already passed the sleeves, so um, other than the little two by two rib panel in the front, I um, am pretty much in that easy to knit mode and I'm also getting some, now that I'm not knitting back and forth, I'm starting to get some interesting pooling happening. Um, I will do practically anything to not have to alternate skeins. I really hate alternating skeins. It is just so troublesome. And plus you're carrying around twice as much yarn. So um, I just will let it pool. This will pool just like this has pooled. It'll pool however it wants. I'm not alternating skeins to avoid that. I don't mind a lot of pooling on this type of sweater. I think it's fine. Um, other ones I, I, yeah, I've made, I have alternated skeins. I do alternate skeins when I need to. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not bothering with this. It's just a two skein project. So, um, yeah. I chose to do a little bit of a rib panel just to give the sweater a little bit of interest on the body. Oh, you know what? Let me lower this back down and turn you back over this way a little bit. There we go. Should have done that earlier, sorry. Um, just because it's, I re was realizing you weren't seeing so much. Um, and I was holding, having to hold it very high. So yeah, I, I chose to do a two by two rib because I just wanted a little bit of interest. I was, I really wanted to do one by one, but I realized a little too late that I should have cast on one, an odd numbered stitch in the front. So I cast on in the center front for my size. I think I, I cast on, I cast on an even number. Um, to join the fronts together and I should have done an odd number and that would have given me an odd number which would would have then allowed me to do one by one because if I did one by one what would happen is that it would look slightly off I wouldn't have been able to do one more row of purl at the other side if that makes sense um, so it ended up being two by two because that way I could I could have a purl like a purl trench on either side yeah oh well It'll give a little interest as well as uh, a little bit of uh, definition to the body. So that is that. Yeah, that's her, that is again a sport weight. 
Merino Sport from Stranded Dye Works. I feel like the last little bit was a little disjointed. Okay. Now for the main whip event. <laughs> At least for me. This, I, all through Vlogmas, or Vlogmas, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, I am in rare form today. Um, I can't even say, I haven't even had a drink, so I can't even say, well, it's because I've been drinking. It's just, no, it's just how I am. <laughs> uh, alrighty. If you've been watching, if you watched my Making Lemonade daily vlogs, this will be very familiar to you. And I haven't made any progress since you saw it last, if you did watch those vlogs. This is the Ching Fiber Kima sweater. Um, if you did not watch my vlogs, don't worry, I'm going to get you all caught up right now. Um, this is a beautiful new pattern that was released about two weeks ago, I'd say, uh, by Ching Fiber. You can buy it from her website or from, I believe she has it on Ravelry too. I bought it from the website. And it is made from a DK weight yarn. I have used some of my own hand spun, some hand spun that I created and designed. Where did I do it? Oh, here it is. Here's what I have left. Um of that. I talked pretty extensively about how I came up with this. Um, this is a four ply yarn. Um, I talked a lot about it in my last episode, so I'm going to send you there if you're curious about the yarn construction. I can just tell you it's a four ply. It's made from Stitch Together Studio and Kim Dye's yarn, two different fibers that I combined um, to get this gorgeous color here. Um, the Kim Dyes yarn had a lot of blue in it, so where you've seen those blue sections, that's from her. That yarn was mostly, or that fiber was mostly white, where um, the Stitch Together was this, anywhere, this basically what you're seeing, a lot of what you're seeing here, not this blue section, but this pink to orange to gold and this kind of kind of slimy green that was all uh, stitched together. Uh, okay, and then the floof that you're seeing down here, this is Veronita by Ching Fiber. So Ching, Layla Ching made the pattern or had the pattern made. I don't know whether it was her design or someone else's, but had the pattern made or made the pattern for her yarn. <laughs> and I was obsessed before I even knew the name, before I even knew the, the fibers. I just thought it was very cool, interesting. Do you need to see it on Martha? I can pin it to her. Man, yeah, probably not. Um, okay. So, I was obsessively working on this for the last two weeks before this past week. And then, I ran out of yarn. So I have about a yard. You can see the end right there. Uh, I ran out of yarn before I finished the pattern <laughs> and I had intended with the same reason that I said about the pink velvet I had intended to make it longer because longer than the pattern was written because of my cup size it's just big and I need a little more material in the front to reach the same you know for it to go drape over and down I need more length um, and for it to also look proportionate um, so I uh, I had to order another skein, so I ran out of yarn before I finished my size. I'm making a, this is a size medium, uh, and uh, I, yeah, so now I'm waiting for the other skein to come from UK. It was uh, already shipped, it's en route, but who knows, with customs, I could be waiting another couple weeks, even a month. Um, so this will just sit on hold while I wait. Um, I did think about ripping it all back out, <laughs> all the floof, up to the DK and lengthening the DK part because I have plenty of that yarn left, but I don't think I'm going to. I really want to see how it looks. 
um, on the body, on my body, before I start modifying it. If I don't like the way it's looking, like the way it's draping and stuff on my body, I uh, I will rip it out. But I, I think it's going to be fine. Like it actually looks like when I'm holding it, you're seeing a lot of gathers here, but that's because it's on a small circumference needle. So it's not going to be like that. And plus this is unblocked. So I think it's going to be more, um, you know, lay more flat-ish and open. It has a uh, drawstring casing at the bottom. It's so pretty. Um, I, I'll, I'll have put a picture on of the finished, of her, of Layla's finished um, object. Um, the, the pattern itself, there's some confusing parts in it. I'm not going to lie. I, I detailed a lot of uh, what I did versus the pattern modifications, pattern mods on my uh, project page. So again, if you are interested and cannot access Ravelry, then do let me know and I can, you know, cut and paste those into an email to you or something. Um, but yeah, there were a couple parts. We, I went, I talked back and forth with a couple other people who were also knitting this and, um, we, you know, we sort of figured out what we thought we should do and how, where we thought there was, um, maybe a different way of interpreting the instructions than the way the instructions had been written. But um, really, it knit pretty fast. Like, each of these, like, you're knitting on such massive needles. This is a 9mm, uh, a US size 13, and you knit the... I just don't want to lose any stitches because that'll be a nightmare. You knit this... DK section on a seven millimeter needle and I just think the fabric it made I was so surprised because seven millimeter I usually would knit this on like a a four millimeter maybe at the biggest and I was so pleased with the way the fabric looks I just think it looks so awesome I mean it's loose but it's still it looks really good yeah pleasantly surprised and these sleeves are just fantastic I have to still make the cuff. I just was waiting. Uh, I could do that while I wait for the floof, but I'm a little concerned that I might have to rip everything out, and I don't want to have to rip out the cuffs too, um, just in case. So I'm going to wait to do the cuffs until I finish the bottom, uh, get to the bottom, and then I can try it on and make sure I like the fit and everything. So, But isn't it beautiful? I just am so happy with the way the yarns are working together. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's the back. It's really an unusually written pattern in terms of like some of the techniques she has you do. The construction is unusual, I shouldn't say, I should say. The back has a drop. There's a drop back. So it'll end up, you see that shirt tail shape. It's going to end up with a shirt tail bottom because of that. But I, oh my goodness. Really, really love it. Love, love, love the yarn. And both of them. I love both of them. Not a huge fan of lace weight, but this is this is fun. This is definitely a fun way. Um, a little, I'm a little concerned about this cat getting caught on things when I wear it, but we'll see what happens. It got caught constantly on things as I was knitting it. Um, so I should be, have this, hopefully I'll have this done by the next time I do a full episode, or if not, it'll be the episode after that, because as soon as I get the yarn, I'm literally like probably half a dozen rows away from the length that I need, because every row you get about a half inch, <laughs> so it's pretty cool. I think I was four rows short as the pattern was written, and I figured out that I needed to do another, and maybe like another four rows, so it probably would be like eight rows total. Um, but yeah, it was good. It was, uh, I don't know if it was the way I knit or if maybe the yield just wasn't predicted properly. Um, it can be pretty confusing as a pattern writer to find your groove for how, how to predict yields for the bigger sizes. Um, so maybe, maybe that one, I don't know. I don't know. Though she is wearing a medium. <clears throat> I'm drinking iced tea. This is uh, Sip of Sage by David. David's tea. I had brewed it hot last night and I had extra, so I put it in the fridge. 
and uh, been sipping on it today. The ice is all melted, of course. Is that all my, oh, I have one more. I kind of debated about not showing you this. This is an, another new cast on. I just cast on all the things the last couple weeks. It's just been, I finished a bunch of things and then cast on a bunch of new things. Um, I hesitated to show you this because this is a Christmas present and I do not think this child of mine watches or anyone he knows watches this episode. So I think I'm okay. Um, anyway, there's not a whole lot of things to show. It's just, it's the start of a sweater. Um, yeah, I just wanted to show you. I was really craving after working on that lace. And when I realized that I needed to wait, I cast on some rustic wool because I was just really craving having some nice crunchy wool in my hands instead of this very thin, slippery cashmere silk lace. So this is 100% Targi wool from from Jill Draper Makes Stuff. So this is her Kingston base in the colorway Front Street. It's got a really nice amount of yield for a DK. And uh, yeah, I am making him a cabled sweater. I don't wanna say too much just in case he is watching. <laughs> Yeah, so I am making a very special cabled sweater for him, and uh, he, yeah, he has no idea. He, I had hinted that I might make something for him last year, so, um, and I just decided I was ready to do it. In fact, that green yarn that I showed you on the green velvet, that was meant for him. I was meaning, I bought it to make something for him because he loves green. But then when I realized I wanted to make a cabled sweater, and cables would never show up in that dark green color, I was like, okay, I have to repurpose this. And then I started to hunt for what would be a nice um, cabled yarn for him. And I realized that this Kingston base is really awesome. And it's just gonna look great in cables because it has such beautiful stitch definition. Yes, I think it'll be really cool. So I'm doing it, it's a bottom up sweater, which I haven't done bottom up in ages. Um, yeah. I'll tell you more next time when I find out whether or not he's watching. And I'll tell you, next time I talk about it, I don't know that I will talk about this in two weeks. Um, I may, um, yeah, I may not have any, if I haven't made any progress. Um, so, so far I've just done a one by one rib bottom and then a stockinette, uh, stockinette body up to the point where I start the cables. So I have to knit about eight inches and then I start the cables. So um, I, I may not show you this again for a while. Just wanted to sneak it in here now, <laughs> just, just in case. Because if I find out that he or his significant other is watching, I will not talk about it anymore. Okay, spinning. Right, I'm up to spinning. I have a very exciting spinning project to talk to you about. Um, but first, just some regular old regular spinning. Uh, I made a second skein of this three ply which works out to be a sport weight um, and this is from Kim Dye's Yarn, one of my favorite fiber people. She made some new fiber. She posted on Instagram. I do not think I'm going to be able to resist it. It is gorgeous and it is coming out in her shop update next week. August 5th I think she said which but I might have the date wrong but it's definitely August something. Uh, yeah, so anyway, Kim dyes yarn. She is a hand dyer in Virginia. There we go. And it is called Good Days, this color. And it is 100% Targi and four ounces, which is why the skein is so unbelievably plump. Um, I have realized that four ounces is about as big as my jumbo bobbins can handle. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so anything more than four ounces, I really should divide it. This is looking really amazing in this light. The shades of purple and blue in here are so beautiful. This is the second of three skeins that I have made. The first one I made a while ago, um, and you can see the color differentiation, even though it's the same 
color. It's just the way the dye and the spin happened. This one is a lot more, has a lot more difference, a lot more like that. There's this this, this shot of green that goes through where this one came out a little more blended. Um, it's a three ply. So um, yeah, that that is one of the reasons why the color gets so mixed up. I do have, I do have one more braid to spin. So I don't know where this is going to fall out. I have a feeling it's going to be on the lighter side. It looks like it's going to be uh, a little bit lighter. Um, so we'll see. This will be something that I will most likely need to alternate skeins in order to blend the color as well. Okay, now I have my spinning experiment to share with you. So I want to show you some pictures because all I have right now is the finished skein. So I'm going to talk to you about this while I show you pictures. So uh, in March, I got some fiber bats from Stitch Together Studio based on the holiday Beltane. And I bought them, I bought a sweater's quantity. They were three ounce bats. I bought a sweater's quantity, nine ounces, three bats, without seeing it. All I saw was her inspiration picture, and I loved the the one I had got ahead of that, Ostera, which I think I got in February. Was it February? About, yeah. April? Easter. Around Easter time. April. So when did I get Beltane? Beltane came after Osteria. Anyway, I loved Osteria so much. And I had a feeling that I would also really love Beltane, and Osteria only got one um, bat, like bag of bats. So I bought, I ordered sweaters quantity. Okay. So the fiber comes, and I'm a little bummed because I don't really think I like the color combo. Um, so I'm going to show you that here. It is um, orange, green, like Irish. St. Patty's Day green and um, pink, like a purpley pink and then light pink too. And it's got some metallic in it, which is fine. It has some Angelina. <laughs> I'm looking at the label. Um, it is made out of Superwash Merino and Angelina. It's very, very nice fiber. So I'm not, I'm a little dubious about the colors. I'm a little slightly bummed because it wasn't exactly what I was expecting. And uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to make it work. So while I was on furlough and I was making my lemonade, making lemonade daily vlogs, I got this idea. I had been knitting that um, baby sweater. I finished the sleeves and spin cycle dream state. And I was looking at the dream state a little closely and I realized that the dream state is a three ply. And then what's cool about all the spin cycle yarns is the way you get this really interesting gradation between the colors and it's sometimes it's colors that are very blendy and kind of go together like blue, shades of blues and greens or shades of reds and purples like or reds and oranges like they all kind of go together and then other skeins are very contrasting so they'll have like uh, like I have one that is orange teal and brown I want to say is in there anyway so I was looking at it and I got kind of excited about those bats thinking that wow I could recreate or kind of do this experimentation to see if I could I, I started to think about how you would get that to work in in a spin and I I figured it out I figured out what, what I had to do and what I had to do was make the fibers like each bobbin, though I would be spinning it from end to end this way, when I laid out the rows of fiber next to each other, they had to match up in color this way to get a gradient. So I had to be thoughtful about what would match, what sections would match in each of the plies to get this impact or this effect of one color going to the next, going to the next, going to the next. So I, I was just looking to see if I had any spin cycle. I do have, this is probably a good one to show you. This is not a, this is not dream state. This is dyed in the wool, which is a two ply, but you kind of get the idea of what happens in a spin cycle 
color. Sorry, I couldn't get it to focus. Um, yeah, so I've, I, I, I will show you a picture of what the fiber rose looked like, how I figured out how the rose should go. I realized like when I first laid it out that I needed some white or an undyed natural color to break up and add to um, the way the colors were gonna combo. And I thought the three main colors, the orange, green, and purpley pink would line up together at some point because they were the biggest quantities. There was also this sort of swampy green in there. So it was like a swampy green, Kelly green, purpley pink, pale pink, and orange. Those were the colors. So I spun it. I spun each bobbin, which I'll show you here. And then I plied it. So my grand experiment. And then when I was done, I skeined it. I twisted it into a skein. I don't have one to show you what I mean. Um, handy. Show you that here. And then I like spin cycle. <laughs> But you don't really appreciate it until it's caked. You can't really understand what's happening in the skein until it's caked. So I caked it. And now I'm going to show you that. And here's what I got. I would say this was a success. Like I think that I successfully got that spin cycle effect. What you're missing when I show you this side is this really pretty sort of creamsicle orangey white section. Um, there you go. See? It's very pretty. I mean, I don't love this. This is this was the problem I had when I was looking at the fiber. I don't really love this peas and carrots kind of twist that happens. Like you get this kind of this, sorry, I'm gonna just do this again. You get this peas and carrots, this like orange. I ended up with like swampy green, Kelly green and orange all together. I don't love it. I don't love that. But the rest of the color combos I think are pretty. I think they're pretty nice. Uh, and and uh, usable. I actually ran out of the purpley pink, even though the I was careful and I had each bobbin was weighing out the mo the, um, evenly. I ran out of the purpley pink well before I ran out of the orange bobbin or the green bobbin. And the orange bobbin ended up just being white at the end, so I have I I ended up just breaking that bobbin off, um, and then. Um, Oh, no, at the, the green bobbin just was green. It was just dark green at the end. So I just broke those two bobbins off and just ended the skein. So it's a little bit, weighs a little bit light compared to what the whole bat was. Um, even though I added white. Is it, is it light? I don't know. I did grams, and this is like 90-ish grams. Uh, and it is a, like, sport DK, I would say, somewhere in there. Um, it, I could probably get away with like a lighter DK ish. I'm going to leave the, I'm not going to make the other two bats like this. What I realized when I was done was that one skein of this was enough. I'm not going to make a sweater out of this. Um, it's just not my colors. And I mean, I just, I don't think I would wear it, but what I might do with it is use this as a contrast color in something like, so then I would get some really pretty gradient. You see that I put the peas and carrots on the outside. <laughs> So that um, I'll be starting with this beautiful sort of creamsicle, orangey, orange, white, and pale pink, and then it'll go into um, these other colors. This, these other colors that that blend nice together. I did end up with the green, orange, and purpley pink all together in a couple different spots. So both here in the center and then further out here, as well. So, and that was fine. They look pretty together. I mean. I don't, I do like these colors together because remember the pink velvet sweater that I showed you and the Saucy Surrey entire sweater that I made, it was the same three colors, only the green was, that pink was only pale pink and the green was more of a mint, which I think is more 
my, my style. The orange was probably equally bright. This deep sort of Kelly shamrock green with the orange, the bright orange and the bright pink just isn't really my jam. I just am not loving it. It's pretty, but not loving it. I probably talk more about what I don't like about this. Then. But anyway, exciting, right? So this is now I know I know how to do make a dream state ish inspired uh, spin. So that was really fun to, to figure out. It was fun that I was able to figure that out. What I will do with the next two bats is I'm going to pull the green out. And the green's going to go in something else. So the green will go mixed in more of its its area of the color wheel. So it will get mixed in with blues or yellows, blues, yellows, like those um, colors. Where the orange and pink I will probably keep together and maybe add in another different color that I think is more complementary. Because my problem is that orange and green clash. Yeah, okay. So that was fun. Hope you enjoyed that. Um, all I have left now are stash, uh, stash acquisitions, which I have a lot. <laughs> I got a lot of stash. I actually don't have the fiber stash um, here. I'll, I'll pop it on screen. I'm going to start with the Lobby and MA because I ended up buying a Lobby and MA kit. I bought a kit. Um, this isn't the kit exactly. The kit was... This color and this color. This is this is Ponyo and Susuke Sus Susuke Ponyo and Susuke from the movie Ponyo by um, Mizuyaki and or Studio Ghibli. And this is confetti cake. Um, this is actually what you're seeing here are two skeins of Ponyo. I just fell in love with the Ponyo color. I didn't buy it right away, and I had regrets. <laughs> I had regrets not getting the color. Um, and uh, yeah, so I realized that I really wanted the color and the only way I could get it, because she was saying she wasn't going to release it, it any more of it until September or October, the only way I could get it was in this kit. And the kit was sport weight and I was like, cool, I can always do another layering tee. I really, really love having a very simple structured pattern that I can mess around with like within that structure there's room to like be creative I really really love that um so really happy with that so I uh, I, I had said when I wrote the pattern and released it that I would be uh talking about it a lot and I would be making a lot of versions of it so um this other beautiful color is called confetti cake it's so pretty it's like a natural with a lot of pink and sort of rainbow um, speckles in it. Really, really gorgeous. But I, I think these are very complementary together. This was this kit was paired with um, We Rainbow. So the kit was actually these three. And I mean, they were, they're all winners. They're just all winners in terms of color. Um, and then what happened was she, she ended up finding some or just, you know, whatever, had some extra skeins that didn't sell of the Ponyo and Susuke colors. So I bought another, a second skein the next day. It was actually the very next day after I placed the order for um, this kit. The kit was for Plumpy Shawl, if you are interested. She had a bunch of them, a bunch of different kits. It wasn't just this one. This was just the one that I, I wanted. Um, and I, I also really loved her other Mizuyaki color, which was Howl and Sophie. And that is this. So this is destined to be the next baby sweater cast on that I will be doing. It's a beautiful natural with much, many, many rainbow colors, pri those primary rainbow colors and it. it's really gorgeous. Um, so this will be my next baby sweater cast on when I'm done with the Elizabeth Zimmerman one. Um, that is going to be, this is going to be a love note. This love note by Tin Can Knits, she makes her patterns from like size zero to six months all the way up to... 60 plus bus size so you get one pattern with all those sizes so uh, I'm planning to make a love note for me so I already had the pattern and uh, I just thought it'd be fun this would be a fun uh, maybe slightly older baby toddler um, once she's walking around like that's the size I'm gonna aim for a year old size I think 
year to two years size of the love note. So yeah, this will be so fun. So fun. Uh, oh, I am wrapping it up <laughs> in case you're like, oh my God, this woman's still going. I'll be wrapping it up. I got a, um, a prize from Christy Glassnitz. So these, this was a surprise package. I ended up getting um, saw a little mini skein set of different mini skeins. This is by Spun Right Round called Pick Your Ma Manic. Pick your, Pack Your Manic. It's a very pretty speckly skein. And this really gorgeous natural yarn, it's called Rosy Green Wool from um, Sport Weight, it's Blackberry Sorbet, it's from England. 100% organic extra fine merino. It's really beautiful, I love that color. And there's also a dark purple skein in here from Mini Skein from Marinated Yarns and a turquoise. <laughs> Not how much I love turquoise. A turquoise skein from Jilly and Kittles. This is actually a plumper. Oh, it says DK. Feels plumper than DK. Uh, in the colorway Bahama Tide. And then included in the kit in the giveaway was this Smart Sticks knitting needle, US size 10. I wish it was a nine. <laughs> because there's a shell pattern I'm going to be making soon um, that needs a nine. But anyway, it's fine. I have nines. So yeah, got that. That was a surprise. And save the best for last. <laughs> it's high time we talk about Ryan Beck, don't you think? Yes, I know Ryan Beck is canceled, and I am bummed, like many people, because um, Ryan Beck is very close to me. It's only about an hour away from where I live. But nevertheless, there are a bunch of us who are still making our Ryan Beck sweaters, and I have decided to do a uh, throwback, so to speak, from Ryan Beck's past. <laughs> I'm gonna make a shifty sweater. So I went ahead and ordered my spin cycle main color. It is this, let me show you. This is, so um, the shifty sweater is a fingering weight or sport weight, I guess this is called sport weight, but it's really knits like fingering to me. Um, the pattern is planned for all spin cycle yarn, um, and I, I always liked it. I just was busy knitting other things when it came out, and I didn't want to put my needles down and spend the money and blah, 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 blah. Um, because usually when Rhinebeck's coming up, I want to save my money to spend at Rhinebeck, but now there's not really any Rhinebeck, so I thought, why not? Maybe this is the time to splurge <laughs> on some beautiful... Uh, yarn. So yeah, so this color, don't you love it? It's right up my alley. The color is called Cassiopeia or Cassiopeia depending on how you pronounce it, how you like to pronounce it, the constellation. And it is, it is uh, Starlight Knitting Society's uh, own colorway. They have two colorways that spin cycle exclusive to them color. Um, that Spin Cycle makes for them. And uh, yeah, I had to have it. Um, they have another one called Andromeda, which is the same. It's very complementary to this, um, and it's just darker. Like it's a deeper, richer color. This is sort of mid-tone pastel, I would say. So if you know the Shifty pattern, it has um, three contrast colors that you put with this. So I have two of them. I'm waiting on the third. The third one's coming. I mean, I have plenty to knit, so I'm not like dying to cast this on necessarily. Uh, I have, and I have plenty of time. Um, so let me see if I can show you. So actually the color I showed you before, the purple. So this is, this is, these are going to be two of the colors. 
This purple is ruination, and this green here is called catastrophe. No, cataclysm. Cataclysm. <laughs> and then the third color that I have that's coming is more of a earth tone color. It's not shades of earth. It's a little bit, it's called rusted rainbow, if you know it. It's um, got like golds and browns. I just wanted something a little more contrast, like contrasty earthy colored. I was really hoping I could use what I had, but the only other one that I have enough of the colorway is stay out of the forest and it's a bright orange. And I just didn't think that would really, though it would be high contrast, it wasn't, it would take me more in, too much to the peas and carrots kind of effect that I just really didn't want. So yeah, that is it. That is my show for this time around, this episode, and I um, hope you enjoyed. I hope you're well. I, I, I didn't really talk about the pandemic like I did, so I really talked about the pandemic, <laughs> the episode that got lost, um, that I lost, but whatever. Um, we'll talk, we, we'll talk more. I'll talk more about the pandemic and such in the, in the coming days. I'm sure that there's going to be more to, more to say and, um, think about and all that, but I do hope that you are surviving and you are staying safe and healthy and that you're, I hope that this was a nice little escape for you to get away from whatever might be ailing you. And I hope you enjoyed, and thank you so much for spending time with me over the last hour or so, and I will see you again in two weeks. Let's take care. Bye.